inner cities break out into race riots uh, for the treatment that African Americans were receiving in this country. And, uh, you know, I was 13 and trying to understand what was going on. And, uh, you know, my older brother said, well, you know, we've heard of these great leaders like Martin Luther King, but here's somebody that you should know about. And the person, of course, that he was talking about was Tom Hayden. So for me, uh, since I was a young child, uh, Tom has been a influence on my life as an example of the type of activism that uh, he models that all of us, if possible, should engage in. So Tom, Tom is, you know, from the early time in his life, he's been a, a civil rights fighter. He was one of the original freedom fighters from the North going down to the South. Uh, students seeking to break segregation in the South. He was the co-founder of the Students for Democratic Society. And of course, for people who know about the original Students for Democratic Society, a huge portion of their work revolved around civil rights. He was a member of the Chicago Seven. He spent 18 years in the California legislature. He's currently a professor of legal studies at Scripps College in Claremont, those lucky students. And he's a contributor to The Nation magazine and, of course, an author. And there's still a few books left over on the table, so they're only $15 a piece. Please take advantage of the reduced price for those books. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Tom Hayden. Okay, thanks. There's, uh, no wa there's no water up here. Right? Thank you. So we're on. How, how is everybody? Are you worn out yet? No. No? Getting Just getting started? What decade is this? I 90 minutes is about enough for me. Um, and uh, I uh, appreciate um, this effort to focus on militarism. And um, I, I'll do what I can to try to uh, pick up where others have left off. And uh, I, may, I may have to wedge together a couple of, um, uh, a, a couple of themes uh, to, to make sense of of this uh, topic, I, I think first of all uh, I should introduce myself a little bit, and um, um, I should s say something about what I do about the war, uh, and then uh, maybe I can add a framework that's more about where I'm coming from, and that may really leave you because. It, 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 I have my own little charts and graphs to get you through. Oh, there it is. It's right up before you. Uh, we'll just leave it there for a moment. Um, but I'm, uh, I turned 70 years old this year. I've been a social activist uh, for 50 years. Um, it was not a planned life. It was an, uh, planning is not my uh, strength. Uh, it's an unplanned uh, journey. Uh, and I often think that uh, it had to do more with uh, when I came of age than anything else. I don't know if I would be the same person if I was 73, um, because that would have put me just before the 60s hit. Um, I would have been on my way to, I don't know where, uh, the the editorial desk of the Detroit News or something, which uh, what I had in mind. Uh, but I, I was, um, I guess, um, the eternal thing about me is that I'm very cantankerous and I'm a nonconformist and I uh, I question everything. And it's it, it's always been interesting to me how my counterparts uh, operate from faith and I operate from doubt. Uh, I love my, my clergy friends. I, I love my uh, Quaker friends, uh, all the people in this room who are, uh, think that faith is necessary. It's always been uh, the people who 
have no faith, no hope for anything, but stand up anyway. That fascinates me. Just fascinates me. I don't know why that is. But, but that's, that's the way I was when I was a kid, and that's the way I am. Uh, and, and I just ran into the um, student movement and civil rights movement when I was a kid. And I happened to be an editor of the uh, college paper in Ann Arbor. And um, that's where I was heading when I suddenly realized there was an opportunity to do, do more than write about things, but to actually become involved as kind of a participating writer or a participating observer, you would call it, in sociology. I never went all the way to being a committed activist in the sense of blindly believing in something and trying to sell it to everybody. That came later when, when I ran for office. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, <laughs> That's a necessity if you run for office. It's a hazard. It's an occupational hazard. It's poisonous. It takes some time to recover. Uh, you have to swear in public a lot in order to show that you're over that, that phase. Um, but uh, uh, you know, it was pretty stunning to see people my age. I was from an all-white suburb. You'll know what I'm talking about. Um, and, and, and um, I, I mean, you think uh, Eugene is white, you should see Royal Oak, Michigan. We had racial covenants that we never knew about, where blacks weren't allowed in after sundown or something like that. Um, the, the, um, to, to see these students, mostly black, but um, all sorts, who were willing to sit in at lunch counters and get arrested, uh, when it meant, it meant the end of their um, uh, life's opportunities for all they knew, maybe the end of their life period, high school, college age. Um, they just didn't want to settle for the world their parents left for them. It was a, uh, hard to discern, impossible to articulate, but that's what it was. They didn't want to settle. And I think that struck me as the, the commonality of the early 60s, that, that people have a, uh, uh, there's a generational factor at work, aside from gender and race and class, there's a generational factor. Uh, each generation has to wrestle with whether they want to settle or whether they want to move forward beyond what their parents left. And often it becomes a generational fight with their parents, uh, whether we like it or not, regrettable or not. Uh, in my case, my poor mom and uh, their mom and dad were divorced. My poor mom never could figure out the difference between Indochina and Indonesia. <laughs> my dad uh, had a simpler solution to the problem of the runaway son who went off to the south. Uh, he simply stopped talking to me for about 20 years. And, and he had another family and a, a daughter, and he, he, he carefully made sure that she never knew she had a brother. So I only met my sister when she was in high school. Fast forward, we all got along well after that, but there was a little interlude there of <laughs> 20 years. And I, um, uh, I, I, I used to be uh, embarrassed telling this story, but, but uh, don't you know, those of you who are in this age bracket, that this is quite a common experience during the 60s and during Vietnam. Uh, parents disowning their children, and sometimes brutal. Uh, get over there to Vietnam because it's going to do you some good. <laughs> and, and the kid goes out of shame and comes back, uh, broken life, broken body, maybe not back at all. The generational fallout was so heavy for parents who took that uh, path um, that I, I wonder that we have any um, fabric of unity and um, ability to cooperate and communicate that we do, uh, because it was, it was brutal. Uh, but I, I, I became quite fascinated. And I was, uh, in 1960, uh, watching a picket line with Martin Luther King marching. I don't know how old he was, in his 30s probably, and 
And um, I, I wanted to get the story. I was at the Democratic Convention in Los Angeles, and I knew that there could be a story by Thomas Hayden on the front page of my college paper if I interviewed Dr. King. So I zeroed right in. I walked along next to him. I don't remember the exact words. It's on microfiche somewhere uh, because I did get the story. Uh, and I asked him all these questions and then went off. And I'm thinking to myself later, uh, what a nice man and how generous of him that to, to answer my questions rationally, calmly. I thought they were brilliant questions at the time. I'm sure they were completely sophomoric. And he'd heard those questions 10,000 10, times. But let it be a lesson to you. You never know who you're talking to. You might as well try to convince them. So, so I, I, on that day, the, the thought dawned on me that I, I was an opportunist who wanted to get a story out of Martin Luther King uh, by pretending to be a, a sympathetic, identifying young journalist. But what I really was was up and coming. And, and I, that, that's the moment at which I began to shift to understand that uh, it's not enough to write about the world. It's also important to try to change the world. And in doing so, you don't give up your critical senses. You don't give up your objectivity. You actually learn uh, in a new way about reality through realizing that if you cast your stone upon the water and a ripple occurs, that's a reality that wasn't there before you took that step. And that's part of what you now can report. You become part of the evidence. You become part of the reality. Uh, trying to just be an, an observer of the reality means you have no uh, interest in or belief in your ability to intervene and change the reality, even, even a tad. I, and uh, a second thing I learned was that amazing changes are possible uh, if you don't plan on them. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a second example. We had this little group that wanted to have, uh, foment the Peace Corps. I'm not talking about today's Peace Corps, but the original idea. Uh, speaking of militarism, it was an alternative to militarism. Alternative service. I must remind you, young people, one and all, that we were subject to compulsory draft. Nothing gets your attention like a compulsory draft. Uh, that's why the campuses were on fire then and not so much today. We were subject to the draft, and we could not vote. So we had this idea there should be an alternative form of service. And the idea was floating around the US here and there. So we, we, we wrote up, we went to a movie at Quaker House one night about thermonuclear war or some other I, I, a Woody Allen type movie. And, and, <laughs> and then we immediately drafted a 10 point proposal to Nixon and John Kennedy. And, and I can't remember all the points, but they were the kind of things that would uh, be appropriate at this conference. Immediate and universal disarmament now. That, that kind of demand. Do this, do this. But in the middle, uh, we had the, um, the, proposer for, the proposal for alternatives to military service in a uh, Peace Corps. And we were going to propose this. And we sent the letter to uh, Nixon, who didn't answer because we sent it to the wrong office. <laughs> uh, we had a backup plan, a guy named Dave McLeod, who was one of our conspirators. Uh, uh, knew where John Kennedy was coming on October 11th, 1960, to Ann Arbor. And he had a friend, one of those Kennedy girls with the straw hats, you know, the kind of people that bounce through the corridors promoting the, the coming of the candidate. And, and he, uh, uh, we sent McLeod up the hallway to find Kennedy uh, and, and give him our proposal in a letter. And sure enough, he did. Here comes Kennedy down the hall, and here McLeod goes up to him. And, and the student organizer says, Senator, this is one of the students who have a, 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 a petition for you from several students. Kennedy opened it. I was not there, but the, the, so the story goes. He opened it. 
he looked at the piece of paper uh, and he simply said, I'm going to speak to one of those issues tonight. And then he went outside in the rain and I was standing there again uh, trying to write the story, get the story on the front page of the paper. And lo and behold, against the advice of his advisors, Kennedy said uh, that he, he was going to institute a Peace Corps. This was at a time when he, I think he was behind one point in the polls. I don't think it did him much good. Uh, but he said it, and we were just uh, stunned at how easy it was <laughs> to propose it. It's amazing. It's amazing. I don't think it ever occurred to us. Anyway, the next day from California, a guy from the Kennedy campaign calls Ann Arbor, gets us on the phone, says, what the hell have you kids got us into? What is this proposal? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know what it was, so we wrote it up. And then uh, one of the people in our Ann Arbor group became one of the early uh, directors of the Peace Corps and so on. So, so it was, it was uh, uh, surprised as part of life and part of history. Um, now, so that's enough about uh, my background. Now, to, today, I, um, I teach at a college in Los Angeles. I'm proud to know that some of the, the parents of one of my students are here uh, monitoring me. Just kidding. <laughs> and and, and um, this, the student is off to a, a gang intervention rehab center in Los Angeles, just as I was at my age, um, going out and exploring um, social issues, urban issues, racial issues. Um, and I, uh, I focus my attention on two things, really. I, and I'll, I'll speak to both of them uh, tonight. One is I'm always trying to generalize my experience and see what patterns there are. I don't, I don't believe those who say we're in a um, postmodern era where there's no single unifying narrative to anything. Um, They've got a point. It's very hard to see the patterns. But I see patterns. And perhaps I see patterns because they come from my experience and not from uh, uh, academic uh, uh, study of um, French philosophers and the like. It, in, my, in my experience, I do see patterns. And I think that the, um, that's very important that we uh, uh, find patterns that connect. Uh, because I think the universe is a pattern and the earth is a pattern and we're part of that pattern organically. Uh, we're not separate from it. If we take that seriously, then it, it can't be complete and random chaos. Even chaos has a certain pattern. Uh, and this is what I teach and this is what this book is about and I'll, I'll get to it in a bit, patterns. But I also know uh, from uh, my, um, my deep desire to get things done, so to speak, that you have to focus. Uh, and that to focus on something is so essential to accomplishment, uh, you have to be aware that, it, that the, the patterns now go in the background. You have to really focus. So I go back and forth like a camera. I zero in and back out, just like the lens. And what I choose to zero in on uh, is always an issue or two, no more than three, where I think behind the specific, there's a, there, there are huge things at stake, life and death. Um, and secondly, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an issue where something can be actually accomplished. And third, I find that it's within my capacity to do something about it. So that, that's a practice I recommend, to pick a focal point of all your concerns where huge issues are at stake and where you can actually make a difference and you can evaluate what your capacity is so you can adjust your capacity to the goal in order to achieve it. So 
it's been a succession of causes um, that I have pursued all my life, sometimes very long periods, 12 years on the Vietnam War, uh, sometimes shorter, trying to put an end to uh, nuclear power plants as a source of energy. I thought we had Dracula defeated, but no, they never, they never, they never go away. And lately, uh, since about 2003, I have focused on uh, what began, uh, uh, in my mind, as the Iraq War. I didn't want to. I'm more interested in Latin America, frankly. I live in Southern California. But the Iraq War was becoming this uh, focal point, this obsession. Uh, and then, uh, as I look back over the years, I started to, to see by about 2005 that the generals and the Pentagon defense intellectuals, the militarists you speak of, were describing this as a long war. And I wanted to see if that was the official US policy and found it was really a doctrine that was developing ad hoc in their minds after 9-11. Uh, and it was to be a, a 50 year to 80 year war over what they called an arc of crisis, which happens to be all in uh, regions that are uh, uh, Muslim areas, Muslim lands, Muslim oil, Muslim gas, Muslim pipelines, uh, and t terrorism. This was the, the picture. And I, I, I realized that Iraq was one battleground in a long war, and that a 50-year long war, undeclared, unrecognized, unreported as such, if it was only 50 years, and they spoke of 50 to 80 years, 50 years would be 15 sep 13 separate presidential terms, Obama would be long gone, 25 two-year sessions of Congress. According to uh, Stiglitz and Bill Mitz, uh, Iraq has now cost three, mil three trillion dollars with a T, uh, way more than is officially uh, acknowledged. Uh, the Afghanistan war, by my, by my count, uh, will, it will be a trillion dollar, a second trillion dollar war if it goes on uh, another five years. The Pakistan war, of course, is a secret war with a secret budget, so just throw it in as an additional expense. We're talking here about um, uh, multi-trillion dollar wars over multiple decades. The casualty rates among um, uh, the uh, American troops, we have relatively accurate information about. On the other side, terrible information, not by accident, but 5,000 dead Americans so far in this long war. Uh, sometime this month or next month, it'll be a thousand in Afghanistan alone. Secret numbers in Pakistan, we don't know the, the losses there. Uh, so you're talking about trillion dollar wars with thousands of American dead. And, and it, it's quite eerie because the uh, American soldiers uh, are tragically killing themselves now in some kind of war that is unspoken in greater numbers than died either in Afghanistan or Iraq last year. More Americans killed themselves, soldiers killed themselves this past year, suicide, than were killed in Iraq or Afghanistan in war. Um, the net effect of this on our budget, according to the best estimates, is that there will be no uh, um, discretionary domestic funding for the rest of the Obama era and successive presidents. That is discretionary money that could be used to invest in weatherization, energy, uh, uh, reforestation, housing, health care. It's simply not there. Uh, if this was a conspiracy, it would look like a way to use the threat of terrorism to freeze the ability of Americans to ever achieve their domestic aspirations. 
And this has been going on all my life as I reckon it and why I've chosen the long war as my focus because most of my life I've tried to improve things in my country, in my state, in my community, housing, civil rights, and so on. And each time I put in a year or two or three, there's the escalation of another war. And that just takes the energy out of the domestic project, takes the funding away. You know the pattern. It's been the pattern that I've been describing earlier as patterns that I realize from my experience whether I can theorize them or not. It's a pattern. And so Obama's best domestic hopes are now over. Young people who are not being drafted and therefore are not as deeply into this as I was when I was draft, draft age have to understand that uh, there's a reason that college tuition is going up. And if you think the price of tuition is bad, where do you get out of college? Uh, what you'll find is your domestic opportunities are shadowed by the long war. There will be no discretionary money for you to spend on anything until you get to uh, tax reform or some other hallucinatory objective. <laughs> but basically, the effect of this is to deny our domestic possibilities with the usual claim that there's a greater threat we have to subdue first, and then we can come back to child care and lesser matters. I'm the father of an adopted 10-year-old, so I care about these things. So this, uh, this long war is um, um, of, of huge um, import to me. And, And, and I've, I've tried to uh, figure out with my experience what has worked in the past and what's most likely to work. Uh, there's m many tools in our toolbox for social change, but, but um, uh, everything with me is improvisational. Try from experience what's worked, try it again, uh, give it up if it doesn't work, and it's left me with these conclusions that the way to undermine a war is through people pressure on the pillars of the policy that underlies the war. That is to say, a war is such an extreme concentration of force that it can't last 50 or 80 years with, without consuming everything. But uh, it, it, it's hard to argue against rationally when people are living in fear. But it does require some underlying foundations, what I call pillars of the policy. And just to give you three examples, but you could, you, could, you could think of five or six or seven, the, 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 the biggest pillar is public opinion. There has to be some public support, significant public support for uh, the, the endeavor. Uh, and so uh, the way to think of working on the, the, the first pillar putting your pressure on it, is always trying to argue with the undecided. You gather among those who you're in agreement with, maybe for nourishment and reinforcement and so on, like perhaps tonight. But the goal is, if you're going to shift the pillar of public opinion, you have to go right after the people who are undecided, and later for the people who are on the other side. We're not there yet with Afghanistan. We're getting there. Among Democrats, a majority are against the escalation. Among all Americans, it's kind of dead even. Um, there's a lot of uh, foggy thinking about how uh, Obama didn't really mean it when he said he was going to go into Afghanistan, or let's give him a chance, or there's, there's a, there's a no. Uh, he knows what he's doing. The question is, do we know what we're doing? By creating a climate, we force him to respond. So uh, uh, that's the first. The, se the second thing, uh, the second pillar is the budget. I've already told you what I think the budget crisis is. But you notice in the peace movement, uh, there's not a lot of coalition building with people who are affected by the domestic budget, right? I would want to go after the seniors, the health care advocates, the housing construction people, uh, the tax reformers, all the people who are going to suffer from trillions of dollars going to the long war instead of 
to environmental restoration, housing, and the rest of it. And, and if you can create a, uh, a coalition against the war budget for domestic needs, you have broadened the leverage, strengthened the leverage of the peace movement, which would otherwise be more narrow. Third example uh, that I've already given, uh, the pillar of the military. Uh, God bless the, the people I met earlier today. I think this one fellow isn't here tonight, but shout out to him. He had, I think he went home to do child care. But out there trying to confront the military recruiters who are cruising around this college trying to pick up kids who are needy, who, uh, who want to answer the cultural call to war. Uh, and we, we need, in front of every high school, every community college in the country, counter-recruiter campaigns so that at least these young people are given the actual choices and are not given, are, are not given a snow job. And the, the, um, I've got them in my class. I mean, it's a pretty fancy deal. I've got a ROTC student in my class. He'll be over there next year. And he's been well treated. And he knows that he's got a contractual obligation. There's nothing he can do about it. He's going, going, gone. In a, in a more just society where college was free, he wouldn't have to be in ROTC. He could make it a choice if he wanted to. And if you think college is free is a dream, you are so right. <laughs> but you could live in France. Sorbonne is free. You could live in Mexico. UNAM is free. You could get into Oxford for a thousand bucks a semester. Uh, only here do we have 39% increases at the University of California. We are alone, uh, and we have to get across to people that the long war is a lone war, and it deprives us of the amenities that other countries routinely enjoy. So, with uh, with these kind of efforts at the pillars, obviously the media is a pillar, the entertainment industry is a pillar, the defense contractors are a pillar, there's all kinds of pillars, but if you concentrate on public opinion and the budget and the military overall, realizing that public opinion is the greatest uh, tool that we have uh, of all of them, then uh, you can visualize how you can slowly undermine the momentum of the war because it needs these inputs, public support, budget dollars, trained troops, high morale, fresh troops, the rest of it. Instead of thinking that um, uh, we, you know, we'll just elect a candidate and then the candidate will take care of it, and, and that is important too, uh, because you don't want to elect candidates who are pro-war if you can help it. That doesn't help with public opinion. But it, you undermine the pillars, you bring about the necessity for the war to end. Uh, so that's how I think about these things. I, um, I want to uh, just now turn briefly to this, this general uh, picture here uh, that you see on the screen. <laughs> Um, I don't believe that social movements are uh, any less important than they were in the 1960s. They might be less visible, and I think that's because we're looking in the wrong direction. Young people have fomented social uprisings, and I keep hearing people my age uh, dismissing it. Um, but it was, it was young people, uh, by and large, who were the propeller force that put uh, the first African-American president in office. It was young people who created uh, Move On, which raised $180 million five years ago for, uh, for, for campaigns. And that's the, the budget of all the Quakers from, 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 from all time. That's, that's an, it's an unbelievable. It was, uh, it was uh, young people that... Um, uh, stormed uh, the WTO in Seattle. It was young people that created the uh, independent media networks. It was young people that first learned how to utilize the electrifying power of the internet. And th these people aren't even 30 yet, so th I, I expect more surprises. But I do think uh, there was an anti-war movement around Iraq. 
There were, t uh, for, for instance, 10 demonstrations of more than uh, um, 100,000 people. Uh, there's probably 100 demonstrations of 10,000 people and so on. So there were, there were people in the streets. Uh, if, if they didn't get beaten and gassed and their heads split open enough to, to, to get your attention, it doesn't mean they weren't there. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw the slide. The biggest anti-war demonstration in the history of the world probably was early 2003. Montreal, 200,000 people in the streets, 20 below zero. Now, I know you're going to say, well, but then what happened? The war didn't end. Well, of course, that's not enough to end a war. Uh, uh, wars are a big deal. They want to see what else you got. But it, wa but it, it was enough people uh, to say that people in the streets were a force to be reckoned with in the uh, mainstream media. The Gallup poll. Uh, the majority of Americans turned against the Iraq war faster than turned against the uh, Vietnam war. The, uh, Michael Moore, no longer hippie fringe outside agitator, underground press guy, but the world's leading producer of documentary films. <laughs> hey, you figure. <clears throat> the Dixie Chicks. Could, could Bush, <clears throat> if, if, if Bush could not slap down the Dixie Chicks like it was the McCarthy period all over again, how is he going to win? Uh, any election or any war. He, he, the Dixie Chick stopped him cold. Homegrown Texas band. Uh, the um, 2006 congressional election. On the eve of that, everybody was once again predicting permanent Republican hegemony for the rest of our lives. <laughs> End of the election, Republicans gone, Democrats in. 2008. Uh, Barack Obama, nobody knows. What a name, Barack Hussein Obama. Let's say it. Let's, re let's remind ourselves. This guy had obstacles. He, 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 he had challenges. And he, he goes out to Iowa. Have you been in Iowa? Well, I or Iowa, Oregon, who's... They, sorry. I know. It's shameful. I, I told somebody earlier, when I'm really tired, I start to go over the edge. I'm drifting there now. But look, the, the, the underlying thing that moved me about the Obama campaign, and uh, make no apology for it, I come from Mississippi and Georgia in 1960. It's the realization of a basic dream of my generation to finally break that color barrier around that White House. I wish they would just call it some other house, but he did that. And, and, but we, we are so not post-racial that Obama could barely say he was a black man. He, he could barely run uh, uh, on the most obvious difference. If you watch them on TV, that's the one thing that he would be accused of, of uh, playing the race card or being an angry black man that he was most worried about. Uh, so he had to have an issue. And thank God, uh, the anti-war movement in Chicago, Marilyn Katz, Carl Davidson, people from SDS back in the day, organized a rally uh, in October 2000, uh, uh, whatever year that was. <laughs> you know, the beginning of the war. And, uh, uh, in the middle of the war, and they, uh, they, they said, well, who are we going to have speak? Oh, we have an alderman. Nah, we've got to have some uh, clergy. OK, fine. Uh, well, what about this young guy, Barack Obama, that just got elected to the Senate? OK, fine. So he, he gives this speech, which is uh, consistent with everything he's ever said about the war subsequently. And he takes a chance, for the first time I know of in American history, <clears throat> A candidate for our president takes an anti-war issue as the defining issue of his primary campaign. Well, Eugene McCarthy did that, Howard Dean did that, of course, but they didn't win. This was the first time a president of the United States was elected who was not only a black man, uh, but the first time the anti-war cause was made into a defining constituency 
that would propel one party or the other into the presidency. So the anti-war movement might have been invisible to some, might have come in disguise, might have come in a mask, but it was there all during this time period. Now, in this, uh, let's go to the model here. Um, see that red block there? That's us. That's life as it is. And there's two contending forces in Tom Hayden's theory uh, that determine uh, how we live. Social movements on the one hand and the Machiavellians on the other. Social movements are small gatherings of people that erupt spontaneously, are unexpected, and draw uh, their power from memories of the past and aspirations that other people can relate to. And they pass through a lot of challenges and trials until they eventually get to the mainstream. And their core demand is realized and they succeed. But in succeeding, they become disfigured and they start to lose their way uh, uh, in the proce very process of winning. Machiavellians are not the big banks, they're the lobbyists for the big banks, the, they're the, the law firms, they're the people who are the power technicians, that's what Machiavelli was. He was not the prince, he was the advisor to the prince, he was the operative to keep the prince in power. The goal of the Machiavellis is to preserve the incumbent's power and expand it a little bit, but make sure that the power is never diminished. Power meaning the ability to make people do things that they don't want to. Power based on two big factors, expansion of your reputation and expansion of your resources. Talking about resources from voting to oil wells, resources. So in the clash, here's what generally happens. The movement, is the, uh, movement cycle is going in one direction and the Machiavellians are fighting them and in the middle, uh, you can picture yourself in this room right in the middle. Reform is the outcome of the conflict between movements and Machiavellians. It might not be the desired outcome. Some might want complete revolution. Some might want no reform whatsoever. Uh, as, the, as the battle is played out, usually uh, there is a mutual accommodation of a temporary nature. The, by reform, let me be clear, I don't mean um, Harriet Tubman on a postage stamp. Although that's a great stamp, if you're gonna buy a stamp. I mean, I, I mean, I mean the movement penetrates the social order on three levels. Institutional opening is created, empowerment for the outside group is created, and tangible benefits are created. And then, like moss crawling over a stone, the order starts to reconstitute itself to contain the reform. There's a backlash, there's co-optation, and there's containment of memory. The reform is real, uh, but that's what you have now. This is the Tea Party is the counter movement to the Obama movement. Follow? Obama's caught between the social movements that got him into the presidency, the elites in the Machiavellian order who don't want anything to change, and the counter movement, which is hysterical about the perception that they're losing status. Racial status, economic status, status status. And the, while you may perceive Obama as a token or moderate president, they perceive him as a black Marxist-Leninist bringing us the Soviet Union's uh, resurrection on American soil, starting with health care. <laughs> so you figure, but that's the, way, that's the way it is. So that means when we, we, we win something that's big, we demobilize and they remobilize, just for a period, for a, a, a period of time, not, not, uh, and not permanently. So you can study this in linear form over my shoulder while I just try to finish up here. That, that's the notion, and um, 
it, it explains to me why um, you get Obama elected and then immediately the movement for health care splinters. Because in reality, uh, he didn't really tell us about Max Baucus. <laughs> he, he didn't tell us about the Senate. Thank you, Ron Wyden, for trying to point that out now and then. Um, he, he knows he can only achieve health care with some permission from the elites. We know that that means we won't get much health care. <laughs> uh, and and uh, we, we, we want uh, Canadian-style health care. It's fine. My wife's a Canadian. I'm all for that. But, but we, we know we can't get it with the present balance of forces. And those who say all he has to do is shout louder and demand it, and he can blow them away, are blowing something else. Because in <laughs> fact, uh, in fact uh, it, it is not that easy. And, and so you see, his health care coalition is now crumbling. It may be irreparable. And in the process, their uh, uh, anxiety level and counter level has risen to the max. And, uh, through, I think, a lot of missed uh, opportunities, he, he has uh, created a situation where the lunatic fringe on the right has been given the issue of economic populism. And this is a disaster. I say this as a lower middle class American from Detroit, that American politics swings back and forth on the mood of the lower middle class people who don't want to drop further from where they came from and would like to move up a little bit. And when they hear, and when I hear, that my prized Medicare might increase in cost, I want to know more. That freezes my uh, desire for revolution. It just does. And it didn't have to be this way, but hey, if you're going to bail out Wall Street and you're going to bail out the Pentagon, you're not going to be able to bail out the health consumer or the student. It's a choice because the, the budget is infinite uh, uh, in possibilities, but finite in terms of the real choices that you have to make. Uh, so I'll, I'll end it there. I do think um, I should say a little more on the, the ending of the long war. Uh, I think Obama knows that this long war is death but he's in the trap that I've described. The reason the signal is that he has a two-part plan for Afghanistan. One is to escalate the war, as you know, and two is to de-escalate the war, almost in the same period of time. So he's talking about a beginning, not an end, a beginning of withdrawal as soon as next year. That is very offensive to the long war advocates. Their position is a war is a war until you win it. You don't tell the enemy that you're leaving or beginning to leave. That's a sign of weakness. This has to go on for 50 years if necessary. And, and, and if we win in Afghanistan, OK, then we can finish the job in Pakistan. And we'll clean up Yemen if we have to. It's going to go on till we win. So a lot of the people in uh, the Pentagon and in the defense co uh, contractor community do not like the idea that he should even consider an exit strategy. And he did so for a reason that I think we should hear very carefully. He said, there's only one country I want to build, and that's the United States of America. He, he, he was presented with data in the White House meetings. Believe that this is shocking. He was presented with data in the White House meetings when he was asking for a memo on what this was going to cost. And when he heard what it was going to cost, which anyone with, uh, anyone with the, the brain of a toad could have told him, he went into shock, which means his advisors didn't tell him. Iraq, three trillion. Afghanistan, a trillion. No end to it. He, he knows the money isn't there. It's an unsustainable proposition. So, so uh, he, he's aware of the pitfall of the long war. But he's also aware uh, th that um, uh, there's powerful forces that want the long war. And he's, he's wanting to know if there's anybody out there in America who's so against it that they're willing to fight and struggle against anybody who is for it. 
and we call the Status of Forces Agreement, right? And it calls for all American troops out, all, all, all out by 2012. And uh, Obama has pledged to that. But you're going to see a stir and cry that there's too much violence in Iraq for us to actually leave, and we should extend our stay. How about this for a brilliant idea? Have fewer American troops there than ever before and get them caught in the middle of a civil war. But that's the idea. And he has to have the fortitude and the foreknowledge that we have to get out of Iraq on schedule. Number two, Afghanistan, he has got to be forced by the American people and Congress to lay out what his exit strategy is. And there can be no exit unless you offer negotiations, direct and indirect, with the Taliban. There can be no exit unless you recognize reality that the Taliban is all over southern Afghanistan, that they cannot be liquidated. And number three, uh, that there's no incentive for the end of the conflict if you don't offer a timeline for the withdrawal of American troops. Not a beginning of withdrawal, but an end of withdrawal. And thank God there's at least one person in the Senate, and I hope that Wyden becomes two, Russ Feingold of Wisconsin, who is going to introduce uh, language uh, imposing a timeline for withdrawal. And we need as many votes as we can get in the U.S. Senate uh, because that's always a sign of things to come. And when the people who are in the fight see that the Senate and the American people are, st are starting to talk about timelines, then the war will start to be undermined. And I know it's painful for people after what you saw tonight on the screen to think about uh, talking to the Taliban, but hey, let me tell you something. We talked with the Taliban about pipelines over and over. We can certainly talk with the Taliban about timelines, deadlines. What's the difference? If they're rational enough to consider building a pipeline for us, they certainly are rational enough to discuss a, t a timetable for our departure. What do you think they're going to do, overrun Kabul? They are a small group with a big base of Pashtun, and they do not have the capacity to do that. It's going to be like Northern Ireland. There's going to be a confederated solution with the country divided into different representative groups and with uh, Afghanistan uh, under Afghan control. It's the best we can hope for. Uh, so these, these are the kind of issues. Uh, if there's funding, obviously uh, the Congress will fund the escalation and the war. But the question is how many Congress members, your five from Oregon, will stand up and vote against the funding. Yeah. And after that, once they've started to fund it, how many will offer amendments? We'll only fund it for one more year. We'll only fund it if there's peace talks underway. We'll only fund it if there's a timeline for withdrawal. We'll only fund it if there's clear human rights standards for the thousands of detainees. We'll only fund it if there's transparency about the drone attacks. We'll only fund it if the secrecy comes off the secret war in Pakistan, etc. These are the kind of issues which I think of as tools for putting pressure on the pillar of the war. And it will have to end, or it'll be the end of us. Uh, I choose us. It, it seems to me people will say, well, one last thing, then we're going to be attacked. Well, yeah, know that. Um, it seems to me, with all due respect, um, with a $50 billion intelligence budget, we were unable to detect 9-11. We were unable to detect Christmas uh, in December. We were unable to detect uh, a gentleman from Africa calling up the CIA and telling them that his son had gone mad and was going to bomb the United States. So I'm done with waiting for protection from the intelligence agencies. It seems to me... Um, uh, what we, need, what we need is pure intelligence, not this kind, kind of uh, twisted intelligence. And pure intelligence tells you that we are going to have to politically deal 
with the issues of the Muslim world in a way that lessens their hatred and lessens their being provoked. And this, this can be done. This can't be legislated. This can only be done by conferences like this one. The dialogue. People don't know about Al-Qaeda, Taliban. They don't know Al-Qaeda, Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda, Pakistan. They don't know. And, and um, this is a, as a result of our first class educational system and, and media. It's not their, not their fault. They don't know anything. Um, uh, but they have good instincts. One instinct is to be scared to death and to try to lash back at anybody that attacks your neighborhood or your country. The other instinct is to, to wonder if we're being dragged into something where we're going to get our butts kicked forever. And they won't be able to send their kid to college because we'll be too busy trying to keep the Taliban in a cave somewhere in Waziristan. So, the, the need for this kind of conference and the extension of it to the undecided voters is the kind of uh, protective climate that has to be created to make the painful extraction from the long war less painful and more endurable. Because it's easy to get into a war, it's much harder to get out. The, the politicians are scared to death of being accused of being soft. We have to be tough enough to create a climate that makes it necessary for them to get out uh, with a responsible plan. And that has to come with organizing and education day and night, 24-7, until that climate is created. I think that it can be done. Um, I've dedicated the rest of my life to it, uh, and I intend to be around a very long time. Uh, but I think it can be done. If not, Everything I've told you is going to come true. The shadow over our future is going to turn into a storm. The deprivation of our domestic budget is going to become permanent. The growth of the Patriot Act into even more repressive domestic legislation is going to increase. Surveillance of anti-war groups and protest groups at home is going to become like a scene out of 24. Uh, we have got to focus uh, on reversing this trend in order to make space uh, for the protection of our, ourselves, our families, our domestic agenda, and uh, the resources and the planet itself. Thank you for having me come. I hope that's been helpful for you. And I'll take any questions that you have. Thank you. So uh, we're going to take questions. Tom Hayden, thank you, yes. Uh, we're going to take questions, but I want to say to people as they're leaving, uh, this conference is in part funded by your contributions, and if you haven't contributed, please make your contributions as you leave. Uh, we were originally formed with a relatively modest grant and are still working off that grant after three years. We're working to get into the mainstream of the college, but we aren't there yet. The college is working to make that happen. But in the meantime, we need your support. So please contribute as you leave. And, so, and before, before you leave, uh, my old community organizer instinct uh, failed me here. I, I try to gather names of people who are interested in the long war wherever I go. About 50 cities, 10, 12,000 names. So if you'd... Uh, be kind enough to share your name and your email address. I'll make sure it's not given to any organizations or salesmen, uh, but it will add to a network of information and analysis of what's going on around the country at local levels and in Canada and in Europe. Would you please, sir, take it and bring it back. Don't let the intellligence agents uh, take it. Because it's a good list. I know it's a good list. <laughs> So we're going to take questions. Uh, Dean will move the mic around. Who's asking? OK. Hi, my name's Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Um, I am really interested in what you had to say about organizing some sort of 
counter military recruitment on high school campuses. When I was going to high school, I went to Thurston High School, most famous for the unfortunate the shooting. Um, but it, it's the re the recruiters are there all the time, all the time. I know. And there's the ASVAB test, which is uh, marketed as some sort of, um, you know, career choice test, but it's funded by the military. Even I, I'll never forget. One day I was taking some sort of adult living or health class and we took a test like what, what careers are you interested in? And um, you were supposed to check off boxes of things that you were, you were interested in, things that you'd like to do in your life. And there was a couple that were like, you'd like to travel, you'd like to um, uh, yeah. climb mountains or jump out of airplanes. And I checked those because of course, I mean, those, those are fascinating things. And they said that I would be perfect for the military. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I got calls from the Navy and you I thought it was the Sierra Club. Yeah. <laughs> I got calls from the Navy and I told them I can't swim. It's not true, I can. Um, and they said, well, would you be willing to learn? And I said, well, I'm a really slow learner. And they said, well, that's okay, we'll take you anyway. You know, um, <laughs> and uh, it, the worst is that it's, it's here. You know, I think of LCC as being such a liberal college and yet there's still military recruiters. I just wonder, what should, I want to do something. I just don't know how I would organize that. Like, well, in a, in a, thank you, uh, in, a, in a town like Eugene, um, demonstrations, protests, civil disobedience in front of recruiters would probably have a popular uh, 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 base. But uh, in, in the end, it's, it's, it's information to families and to young people. Uh, you know, the, the very capitalist notion of a marketplace of ideas does not exist. You're, you're overwhelmed. You're occupied by the recruiters who have a slant on it. They have done focus groups and market research on their target population. Uh, and all you got are some leaflets and some friends. So it seems that you're um, outwitted. But I think you're talking about people who go through many stages of thinking about it, choosing, and then if they go into the service, they, they still have every right to think about it. Uh, uh, a great many, a, a gr very high percentage of the troops in on the battlefield are against the war. Yeah, they, they love, they're fighting for their buddies. And, and, and they come out and then they get uh, stop loss, they get, they get sent back and again, and, and then there's the hospital if they get injured, God help them. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a long period of time that you're, you're focused on. You have a long struggle. Uh, uh, and, and all you really need, I think, is to say uh, both sides should be heard. And you'd be amazed at uh, how many people think your side should not be heard so you can get into an interesting little battle with the school board or the administrators about your right free speech to stand on a sidewalk and so on. Uh, so I, I, I think it's, it's worth it. Uh, as a very gradual proce process of eroding the pillar. Tom, can I add Thank you for what you're doing. Uh, oh, nuts. I just want to say that in, you have to be miked. In Eugene, there are two groups, uh, Calc and uh, Eugene Peaceworks, that do counter recruitment work. So if you contact them, uh, they can give you uh, they can give you information about how to move forward. Is that the veterans? Also for Veterans for Peace as well. Veterans for Peace, gentlemen, right there. Thank you, good. There it is. Um, hi, I had a question for you um, that's a little cynical, but I think you ought to be asked, uh, is the magnitude of what we're dealing with here. And I, when we, the, you know, the whole thing about um, they want to come have a complete withdrawal by 2012, while at the same time they're building uh, and have been building permanent bases in Iraq. Um, I personally view it as a ruse, and I, they have, it would be very simple for them to stage some kind of, um, like they do all over the world, the CIA and so forth, um, to stage some sort of uh, violence that would require them to stay, along with the complicit mass media who follows through and, 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 and you know, puts out on this fake theater of, of he said, she said, and we come to the same conclusion, which is the Pentagon's, and we keep going and going. When you're dealing with that kind of psychological warfare, how do you fight that? I mean, when you have a public that's so credulous and it's, you know, it's, it's such a, it's so 
ingrained. It's it, it, you know, and they this is their Machiavellian way how, how yeah. they how they how they fight. So, just your thoughts on, you know. That, from that angle, I mean, you know, how do you... I, I'm not uh, a big believer in optimism and, and faith, as I said earlier. <laughs> <laughs> so I have an advantage over you. I've got nothing to lose. I, I expect the worst and I fight for the best. Um, I realize people are not like that and they need uh, slivers of hope. But um, I, I think it would be a mistake to think that the, the bad guys always win, if I could put it that way. Um, they, they make mistakes. Uh, if it were not for their mistakes, there would be no social movement. I mean, it takes an interaction between the mistake of the Machiavellian and the rise of the movement. And, and frankly, a lot of them, them, uh, have had some sense bashed into their heads by this terrible experience. I think that they're trying to make their retreat from Iraq respectable because they don't want their reputation tarnished. But they know there's a big problem of getting down to 30,000 American troops in that country with Iran next door and then saying, we're staying. Yes, the negative side of your, th your thinking says, well, they want to have a permanent base. The other side is, uh, I'm thinking, uh, that they could be overrun in a new offensive from within Iraq uh, or from Iran or bled to death by Al-Qaeda attacks if they're a stationary 30, force of 30,000. You can't defend that country with 30,000. And that's, that's why uh, some in the establishment think they all got to go. Uh, and they might add on, well, we want to send them to Afghanistan. That's, that's true. But they, they see there's no sense leaving 30,000 American troops in a crossfire. It's more for them, how do you get out and make it appear that you weren't forced out? Uh, and I, I think that they're still trying. They're trying to get through this election. And it, Another example of the, uh, the problem uh, uh, of ceding them too much um, you know, power and authority is that they, I don't think they planned to deliver Iraq to Iran, but that's what they did. Yeah. They're describing it as a democratic process. Well, yeah, they put the Shia majority uh, in um, power. Sistani, the Grand Ayatollah, was born in Iran. Uh, Sadr, the leader of the urban poor, he, he's hiding in Iran. Uh, the uh, Dawa party and the uh, Skiri were sheltered in Iran during uh, the past conflict uh, with Saddam. So we have enhanced uh, Iran's power standing in the region. And how that is being interpreted on the cover of Newsweek as an American victory, I don't know. But it fits the, uh, the theory here that it's all about memory. They're now fighting. I think they're not fighting for a base in Iraq so much as they're fighting for a version of memory that we won. And they've also got what the two things they wanted. They wanted to get rid of Saddam. Uh, and two, they want to get the Western oil company, companies in after 40 years of being out. And the Western oil companies, among other international oil companies, are signing contracts, are lining up, and are going to make a ton of money. Uh, so withdraw the troops as long as the oil companies are in. Now, the cynic will say, oh, no, that's more reason we have to have troops. <clears throat> I wouldn't like to be a small contingent of Marines guarding an oil plant in a country of 25 or 30 million hostile people. But you never know, because we're exhausted. It's, it's not like a lot of Americans are going to fight to push out the last American soldier. The American attitude on this is the, uh, isn't that war over, right? Yeah. Uh, so we don't have a lot of strength left on our side. It's, it's been diverted by Wall Street, health care, and Afghanistan. But I do think if Obama starts to slip, as you predict, 
there will be a response from a lot of people in this country, and he has to count on that because that would be the end of his last great premise, promise, the one that he was elected president on, and it's going to be hard for him to just uh, retreat from that. We can make it hard for him to retreat from that. Yeah. 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 Hi. Thank you. Uh, is it not the case that Dennis Kucinich was just successful in getting some kind of a preliminary resolution passed and next Wednesday on the House floor we get three hours of debate um, on Afghanistan? And, and I think that it's even written that, that there's a suggestion we leave within 30 days or certainly by December 31st this year. Would you talk about that a bit? Yeah, I'm doing a review of um, the current state of the anti-war movement uh, for the nation on Monday. I interviewed uh, Kucinich yesterday. Um, here's the deal. Uh, under Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution, the Congress has the power to declare war. That got muddied up under legislation at the end of the 60s that was called the War Powers Act, which we were all for because we were opposing the Nixon executive. Uh, but under the War Powers Act, the power of Congress was actually diluted uh, to be uh, coterminous with the executive, that the executive and Congress should share in this. Uh, this is all written up in a quite, quite a brilliant and useful book by Gary Wills that's just out called Bomb Power. Uh, what Kucinich is doing, which is the right of any member of Congress, is he's He's introduced a resolution under Article 1, Section 8, and he's gotten agreement from the House, I think they have to do what they're doing, to have a debate scheduled for three hours on Wednesday. Anyone can come to the microphone. He has um, 17 co-sponsors, so you know, they sure do know how to talk. That three hours will be eaten up. Uh, but then, uh, I believe, uh, it's hard to, to say with certainty, but I believe then there has to be a vote. And the, so the good news is the measure initiates debate for the first time on a war that's already underway. And it forces uh, members of the House to vote yes or no or abstain. Um, it's possible, the danger is, that very few will vote no. It's possible that the Congress on Wednesday will approve the war in Afghanistan by a vote. It's possible the largest number will be abstention. I don't know. So it's, it's kind of frightening on that end. When the three hours are over, they have to vote. They're not going to vote to end the war, I don't think. So the second part of your question is irrelevant. 30 days out unless the president says he can't do it, then he has till the end of 2010, one year. That's what the, that's what the War Powers Act says. But that, for that withdrawal to occur, there has to be an affirmative vote to, to refuse to approve the war. And I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. But it's a, it's a good start, and it can have a, a, a depressing ending, <laughs> right? Then comes um, the vote on the $33 billion for the escalation. That's Barbara Lee. Uh, and then two things that ha that's going to lose, but um, that's an opportunity for amendments. And then where, uh, the, in terms of the positional warfare that's going on, there's other things that are in front of uh, the president. He's got McGovern with a majority, um, isn't it a nice name, McGovern, Jim McGovern of Massachusetts. Uh, he's got a soft resolution that c calls upon Obama to present an exit strategy, which sounds kind of empty, but uh, Obama already said he's supposed to have an exit strategy. So now it's a tangible question by December, tell us how you're going to exit. And he's got, McGovern has a majority of the Democratic members of the House uh, supporting that. Uh, so that could pass, or more important, lead to hearings uh, on the exit strategy. And then you have um, 
Feingold, who votes against all these military budgets anyway, but has a lot of respect. Um, I think he'll probably introduce a, an amendment to set a timeline for getting out. And, and those will get some votes. I, I, I don't know if they get a majority, but the, the exit strategy and the withdrawal uh, bill could get quite a lot of votes. <clears throat> and that might be enough to undermine the pillar. All of these cumulatively going into the 2012, 2010 election and the 2012 election, um, Obama may be facing um, a passive revolt or passive refusal to go along in his own party and may be relying on Republicans to support the war effort and, you know, he knows very well that from the Republican point of view, the, it's a two-step. One, get him deeper into Afghanistan. Two, end his presidency. So he, they're not the kind of allies that Barack Obama would want. Uh, so my goal would be get the, his party to abandon the war and put him in a situation where he can only depend on Republicans. Uh, and, and, and is that doable? It's a long shot now, but by next year, yeah, I think it is doable. Cool. And Kucinich gets credit, I think, for starting the ball rolling. Don't you think? Yeah. yeah. Hello again. Okay, hi, I'm Sherry. I'm Sherry, I met you earlier. Um, hi, Sherry. Hey. Um, I asked somebody, uh, I asked um, Michael Moore this question when he was here a few years ago, and I'd be happy to tell you his answer if you would answer the same question first. <laughs> I don't want his answer. It's, it's answer. a trick, it's a trick. No, it's not a trick at all. Um, I wonder, it sounds like you are um, behind the idea of boycotting as a tactic, and I wonder, um, is that true? Do you feel like boycotting um, is a powerful tactic, and how far could we go with that uh, on Moss or individually? Uh, there, there, there have been very successful boycotts, the Tea Party being one, the, the original one, uh, Montgomery, <laughs> Mon Montgomery bus boycott. They're in the category of social movement tactics that are unpredictable. Why that bus boycott broke out in Montgomery? You know, those people walked in freezing weather for like 300 days rather than board a bus. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it's unpredictable. So all, I, all you can say is that it's, it certainly uh, should be an, an, an approach to be promoted. And it can begin with personal life and among your friends just as exercise, pure exercise in starting to carve out a definition of yourself. Whether it takes off is probably beyond your control, but uh, you want to do it for more than your personal reasons. So the issue should be absolutely as clear as possible for the public in case somebody's inspired by your, uh, your, your action. Um, uh, I don't, what did Michael Moore say? <laughs> a whole lot less than what you just said. <laughs> well, he said, "Well, you can't." He's a visual guy. He said, "You can't boycott everything." He did. Oh, he's got a conflict of interest. Uh, I want to uh, just uh, yes, and then one last thing I wanted to say, and I think we're wrapping up. Are you trying to wrap us? Appreciate it. Okay, quickly. Well, I think social movements uh, need c communities of meaning, which includes music. What comes first is a good question. I leave that to Jim Page. I don't know. Uh, you know, like, w We Shall Overcome was there in the 30s and the 50s, then it went away. And then uh, a transmitter of that tradition 
picked it up when the civil rights movement was taking off, and it, um, it stuck, it remained. Um, I, the, the most moving thing about Obama's inauguration, by the way, was Pete Seeger, who was once blacklisted, singing This Land is Your Land with Bruce Springsteen. I thought that was very, very cool of the Obamas to allow that to happen because Seeger was there when nobody else was there. He was there in the good times and the bad, and he's 94 years old, and to be allowed to perform at uh, inauguration would be very good for his health uh, and, and ours. So um, I, I, my wife is a musician. I'm, I'm not. My kid is a musician. I'm not. Um, but to the extent I know anything about music, I identify with the folk tradition, uh, which is the simple idea that music comes from the grassroots up and the performer is a, like a narrator. And along the way, it got hijacked. I, and I enjoy the hijacking. I'm a willing, willing victim. Uh, where we become passive, and the music comes from a stage at us. Mm. But, but the real tradition was these songs were hammered out by people carrying hammers. And they were so good because it was the rhythm of working people or or uh, masses of people who, who wanted to put together a rhythm and a sound and words that would um, come directly from their experience. And, and uh, it's not to put down uh, classical music. It's just where I'm coming from, social movements, uh, music is an inherent part of the, the uh, bottom-up process of social movements. <coughs> And so it will come, but it's um, more likely uh, we're in for a period of blues. <laughs> Don't you think? Yeah. Blues is good. <laughs> got, got a lot of people through some very bad times. Uh, let me just end with a list of the reforms that were accomplished by the 60s before they're forgotten. To leave you on a, a note of surprise. Um, because I didn't want to face this. I, I wanted revolution, but I would settle for some reform. But I was in the camp of people who were always kind of disappointed. But if you look back, it looks different than it did at the time. Voting rights for 26 million Americans, southern black people and 18 to 21 year olds. The end of the Indochina Wars in which at least 2 million people including 58,000 Americans, were killed. The end of the compulsory military draft. The fall of two presidents. New congressional checks on the imperial presidency, the CIA, and the FBI. Amnesty for 50,000 draft evaders who had gone to Canada. Normalized relationships with Vietnam. The Freedom of Information Act. The Media Fairness Doctrine. The Roe v. Wade decision. The toughest environmental, consumer, and health and safety laws that have been passed since that time. Union rights for public sector employees. The first collective bargaining rights for farm workers. Fundamental reform of school and university curricula and admissions. Greater freedom of sexual desire and a decline of censorship. Expanded participatory rights for many marginalized minorities from college students to disabled Americans. For example, speaking of memory, I, I, I know of no one as we cross the street and see the ramps on the curbs. I, I, th I think we should bless the memory of the people in the disability groups and the wheelchairs who took the idea from the southern sit-in students, who took the idea from the 1930s industrial workers and rolled into Washington one fine day in 1975 and occupied government buildings until they got the Americans with Disabilities Act and funding. These are, these are, there's three approaches to memory. One uh, I hope you subscribe to is that it's important to remember uh, as legacy 
for future generations and to never allow the establishment to claim credit for what they gave unwillingly. Yeah. Yeah. Two, two, two uh, if we don't do it, then we give advantage to those who want to liquidate the memory. And three, I think the biggest scoundrels of all are the people that I would call the politicians of memory, who have a selective memory and they want to uh, put Malcolm X's face on a postage stamp or name a road for Cesar Chavez or build a memory of Martin Luther King as only being for nonviolence uh, and respect for God. Uh, and for civil rights for just a narrow majority. They leave out his railing against the military budget. They leave out his railing against the Vietnam War. And that's because they, and we can say who they are if we need to know, they were against all that. The New York Times chastised King for speaking out against the Vietnam War. They said it's not his business. So, 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 so why would they memorialize it? Only we can do that. And, and uh, you're, now, um, you're, you're now looking at le at least one person, and maybe some of you with the same condition. Uh, I was there at the beginning. I was blessed to be there at the beginning. Do you understand that we're now entering the 50th anniversary of everything that happened in the 60s? Yeah. 50. So get out your calendars, ladies and gentlemen, and march and celebrate, because if you don't, uh, you're going to see the media remember things they want to remember, and the right wing try to discredit everything that was accomplished. Uh, and uh, our children won't know, you know, and grandchildren, what the hell went on? Uh, in, in this book, I decided a couple years ago to write this book and build a database, and you can go to my publisher, and the database of everything that ever happened in the 60s is there, with citations, footnotes, <laughs> local survivors that you can call uh, when it happened. And if you read it, it's quite astounding. And it's already underway. We're already into March. Uh, and and um, you'll see 50th anniversary recognitions of this, that, or the other uh, every week now until the de this decade is over. And then, you know, there's a lot of people that want the 60s to die uh, for the wrong reasons. Uh, there's a lot of people like young people who want the 60s out of the way. I understand that. But you've got to give us one more break, 10 more years. Then we will die our nice, natural, organic death. And, and, and you can be done with us. But there's ten, 10 more years. Thank you very much. So let's thank all of our, our presenters tonight, Tanita Weiss, Gwen Kirk, Jim Page, and Tom Hayden. And thank you for coming. Make sure you contribute on the way out. We really appreciate you being here.